Hibernation 70. Grizzlies Growls presents Stories from the Hibernation. Read by David Grizzly Smith. Flatland, a romance of many dimensions, by Edwin Abbott Abbott, read by David Grizzly Smith. Part Two, Other World. Section 15. Concerning a Stranger from Spaceland. From dreams, I proceed to facts. It was the last day of the 1999th year of our era. The pattering of the rain had long ago announced nightfall, and I was sitting in the company of my wife, musing on the events of the past and prospects of the coming year, the coming century, the coming millennium. When I say sitting, of course, I do not mean any change of attitude, such as you in space signify by that word, for as we have no feet, we can no more sit nor stand, in your sense of the word, than one of your souls or flounders. Nevertheless, we perfectly well recognize the different mental states of volition implied in lying, sitting, and standing, which are to some extent indicated to a beholder by a slight increase of luster corresponding to the increase of volition. But on this and a thousand other kindred subjects, time forbids me to dwell. My four sons and two orphan grandchildren had retired to their several apartments. My wife alone remained with me to see the old millennium out and the new one in. I was wrapped in thought, pondering in my mind some words that had casually issued from the mouth of my youngest grandson— a most promising young hexagon of unusual brilliancy and perfect angularity. His uncles and I had been giving him his usual practical lesson in sight recognition, turning ourselves upon our centers, now rapidly, now more slowly, and questioning him as to our positions, and his answers had been so satisfactory that I had been induced to reward him by giving him a few hints on arithmetic as applied to geometry. Taking nine squares, each an inch every way, I had put them together so as to make one large square, with a side of three inches, and I had hence proved to my little grandson that, though it was impossible for us to see inside the square, yet we might ascertain the number of square inches in a square by simply squaring the number of inches in the side. And thus, said I, we know that three squared, or nine, represents the number of square inches in a square whose side is three inches long. Well, the little hexagon meditated on this a while, and then said to me, But you've been teaching me to raise numbers to the third power. I suppose that three to the third must mean something in geometry. What does it mean? Well, nothing at all, replied I, not at least in geometry, for geometry has only two dimensions. And then I began to show the boy how a point, moving through a length of three inches, made a line of three inches, which may be represented by three, and how a line of three inches, moving parallel to itself through a length of three inches, makes a square of three inches every way, which may be represented by three square. Upon this, my grandson, again returning to his former suggestion, took me up rather suddenly and exclaimed, Well then, if a point moving three inches makes a line of three inches represented by a three, and if a straight line of three inches moving parallel to itself makes a square of three inches every way represented by three squared, 
then it must be that a square of three inches every way, moving somehow parallel to itself, but I don't see how, must make uh, something else, but I don't see what of three inches every way. Then this must be represented by three to the third. Oh, go to bed, said I, a little ruffled by his interruption. If you would talk less nonsense, you would remember more sense. So my grandson had disappeared in disgrace, and there I sat by my wife's side, endeavoring to form a retrospect of the year 1999 and of the possibilities of the year 2000, but not quite able to shake off the thoughts suggested by the prattle of my bright little hexagon. Only a few sands now remained in the half-hour glass. Rousing myself from my reverie, I turned the glass northward for the last time in the old millennium, and in the act I exclaimed aloud, "'That boy is a fool!' Well, straight away I became conscious of a presence in the room, a chilling breath thrilling through my very being. "'He is no such thing,' cried my wife, "'and you are breaking the commandments and thus dishonoring your own grandson.' But I took no notice of her. Looking round in every direction, I could see nothing. Yet I still felt a presence, and shivered as the cold whisper came again. I started up. "'What's the matter?' said my wife. "'There is no draft. What, what are you looking for? There, there's nothing.' Well, there was nothing, and I resumed my seat again. Well, "'The boy's a fool, I say. Three to the third can have no meaning in geometry.' Well, at once there came a distinctly audible reply. The boy is not a fool, and three to the third has an obvious geometrical meaning. Well, my wife, as well as myself, heard the words, although she did not understand their meaning, and both of us sprang forward in the direction of the sound. What was our horror when we saw before us a figure? At first glance it appeared to be a woman seen sideways but a moment's observation showed me that the extremities passed into dimness too rapidly to represent one of the female sex. And I should have thought it was a circle, only that it seemed to change its size, in a manner impossible for a circle or any regular figure of which I had experience. But my wife had not my experience, nor the coolness necessary to note these characteristics. With the usual hastiness and unreasoning jealousy of her sex, she flew at once to the conclusion that a woman had entered the house through some small aperture. "'How comes this person here?' she exclaimed. "'You promised me, my dear, that there should be no ventilators in our new house.' "'Nor are there any,' I said I. "'But what makes you think this stranger is a woman? I see he by by power of sight recognition.' "'Oh, I have no patience with your sight recognition,' replied she. "'Feeling is believing, and a straight line to the touch is worth a circle to the sight.' Two proverbs very common with the frailer sex in Flatland. "'Well,' said I, for I was afraid of irritating her, "'if it must be so, demand an introduction.' Assuming her most gracious manner, my wife advanced toward the stranger. "'Permit me, madame, to feel and be felt by.' and then suddenly recoiling. Oh, it is not a woman, and there are no angles either, nor a trace of one. Can it be that I have so misbehaved to a perfect circle? I am, indeed, in a certain sense, a circle, replied the voice, and a more perfect circle than any in Flatland. But to speak more accurately, I am many circles in one. Then he added more mildly, I have a message, dear madam, to your husband, to which I must not deliver in your presence, and if you would suffer us to retire for a few minutes. But my wife would not listen to the proposal that our august visitor should so incommode himself, and assuring the circle that the hour for her own retirement had long passed, with many reiterated apologies for her recent indiscretion, she at last retreated to her apartment. I glanced at the half-hour glass. The last sands had fallen. The second millennium had begun. Section 16 
how the stranger vainly endeavored to reveal to me in words the mysteries of Spaceland. As soon as the sound of my wife's retreating footsteps had died away, I began to approach the stranger with the intention of taking a nearer view, and of bidding him be seated, but his appearance struck me dumb and motionless with astonishment. Without the slightest symptoms of angularity, he nevertheless varied every instant with gradations of size and brightness scarcely possible for any figure within the scope of my experience. The thought flashed across me that I might have before me a burglar, or a cutthroat, or some monstrous irregular isosceles who, by feigning the voice of a circle, had obtained admission somehow into the house and was now preparing to stab me with his acute angle. In the sitting-room, the absence of fog, and the season happened to be remarkably dry, made it difficult for me to trust to sight recognition, especially at the short distance at which I was standing. Desperate with fear, I rushed forward with an unceremonious, "'You must permit me, sir,' and felt him. My wife was right. There was not the trace of an angle, nor not the slightest roughness or inequality, never in my life had I met with a more perfect circle. He remained motionless while I walked round him, beginning from his eye and returning to it again. Circular he was throughout, a perfectly satisfactory circle. There could not be a doubt of it. Then followed a dialogue, which I will endeavor to set down as near as I can recollect it, omitting only some of my profuse apologies, for I was covered with shame and humiliation, that I, a square, should have been guilty of the impertinence of feeling a circle. It uh, was commenced by the stranger with some impatience at the lengthiness of my introductory process. Have you felt me enough by this time? Are you not introduced to me yet? Most illustrious sir, excuse my awkwardness, which arises not from ignorance of the usages of polite society, but from a little surprise and nervousness consequent on this somewhat unexpected visit, and I beseech you to reveal my indiscretion to no one, especially not to my wife, but before your lordship enters into further communications, would he deign to satisfy the curiosity of one who would gladly know whence his visitor came? From space, sir. From space. Whence else? Well, pardon me, my lord, but is not your lordship already in space? Your lordship and his humble servant, even at this moment? Oh, Paul, what, what do you know of space? Define space. Well, space, my lord, is height and breadth indefinitely prolonged. Exactly. You see, you do not even know what space is. You think it is of two dimensions only, but I have come to announce to you a third, height and breadth and length. My, your, your lordship is pleased to be merry. We also speak of length and height, or breadth and thickness, thus demoting the two dimensions by four names. But I mean not only three names, but three dimensions. Would your lordship indicate or explain to me in what direction is this third dimension unknown to me? I came from it. It is up above and down below. My lord means seemingly that it is northward and southward. I mean nothing of the kind. I mean a direction in which you cannot look because you have no eye in your side. Pardon me, my lord. A moment's inspection will convince your lordship that I have a perfect luminary at the juncture of my two sides. Yes, but in order to see into space, you ought to have an eye not on your perimeter, but on your side. That is, uh, on what you would probably call your inside, but we in Spaceland would call it your side. An eye on my inside? An eye in my stomach? Well, your lordship jests. I am in no jesting humor. I tell you that I come from space, or since you will not understand what space means... From the land of three dimensions, whence I but lately looked down upon your plane, and which you call space, forsooth. From that position of advantage, I discern all that you speak of as solid, by which you mean enclosed on four sides, your houses, your churches, your very chests and safes, yes, even your insides and your stomachs, all lying open and exposed to my view. 
Well, such assertions are easily made, my lord. But not easily proved, you mean. But I mean to prove mine. When I descended here, I saw your four sons, the Pentagons, each in his apartment, and your two grandsons, the Hexagons. I saw your youngest Hexagon remain a while with you and then retire to his room, leaving you and your wife alone. I saw your isosceles servants, three in number, in the kitchen at supper, and the little page in the scullery. Then I came here. And how do you think I came? Well... Through the roof, I suppose. Not so, not so. Your roof, as you know very well, has been recently repaired, and has no aperture by which even a woman could penetrate. I tell you, I came from space. Are you not convinced by what I have told you of your children and household? Well, your lordship must be aware that such facts touching the belongings of his humble servant might be easily ascertained by anyone in the neighborhood, possessing your lordship's ample means of obtaining information. How shall I convince him? Surely, surely a plain statement of facts followed by ocular demonstration ought to suffice. Now, sir, listen to me. You are living on a plane. What you style flatland is a vast level surface of what I might call a fluid on or in the top of which you and your countrymen move about without rising above it or falling below it. I am not a plain figure, but a solid. You call me a circle, but in reality I'm not a circle, but an infinite number of circles, so of size varying from a point to a circle of 13 inches in diameter, one placed on top of the other. Now, when I cut through your plane, as I am now doing, I make in your plane a section which you very rightly call a circle or even a sphere, which is my proper name in my own country, if he manifest himself at all to an inhabitant of flatland, must needs manifest himself as a circle. Do you not remember, for I, who see all things, discerned last night the phantasmal vision of Wineland written upon your brain, do you not remember, I say, how, when you entered the realm of Lineland, you were compelled to manifest yourself to the kings not as a square, but as a line, because the linear realm had not dimensions enough to represent the whole of you, but only a slice or a section of you. In precisely the same way, your country of two dimensions is not spacious enough to represent me, a being of three, but can only exhibit a slice or a, a section of me, which is what you call a circle. Now, the diminished brightness of your eye indicates incredulity, but, but now prepare to receive proof positive of the truth of my assertions. You cannot indeed see more than one of my sections or circles at a time, for you have no power to raise your eye out of the plain of flatland, but you can at least see that as I rise in space, so my section becomes smaller. See, now I will rise. And the effect upon your eye will be that in my circle will become smaller and smaller till it dwindles to a point and finally vanishes. Well, there was no rising that I could see, but he diminished and finally vanished. I winked once or twice to make sure that I was not dreaming, but it was no dream. For from the depths of nowhere came forth a hollow voice, close to my heart, it seemed. Am I quite gone? Are you convinced now? Well, now I will gradually return to Flatland, and you shall see my section become larger and larger. Every reader in Spaceland will easily understand that my mysterious guest was speaking the language of truth, and even of simplicity. But to me, proficient though I was in Flatland mathematics, it was by no means a simple matter. I mean, the rough diagram given... Herewith will make it clear to any spaceland child that the sphere, ascending in three positions indicated here, that must needs have manifested itself to me or to any flatlander as a circle. Uh, first is full size, then small, at last very small indeed, and approaching to a point. But to me, although I saw the facts before me, the causes were as dark as ever. All that I could comprehend was that the circle had made himself smaller and vanished, and that he now reappeared and was rapidly making himself larger. 
and when he had regained his original size, he heaved a deep sigh, for he perceived by my silence that I had altogether failed to comprehend him, and indeed I was now inclined to the belief that he must be no circle at all, but some extremely clever juggler, or else that the old wife's tales were true, and that, after all, there were such people as enchanters and magicians. Well, after a long pause, he muttered to himself, one resource alone remains. If I am not to resort to action, I must try the method of analogy. Well, then followed a still longer silence, after which he continued our dialogue. Well, tell me, Mr. Mathematician, if a point moves northward, leaves a luminous wake, what name would you give to the wake? Well, a straight line. And a straight line has how many extremities? Two. Now, conceive the northward straight line moving parallel to itself, east and west, so that every point in it leaves behind it the wake of a straight line. What name would you give to the figure thereby formed? We will suppose that it moves through a distance equal to the original straight line. What name, I say? A square. And how many sides has a square? And how many angles? Four sides, four angles. Uh, now, now stretch your imagination a little and conceive a square in flatland moving parallel to itself upward. What, northward? No, no, no. no not northward. Upward. Out of flatland altogether. If it moved northward, the southern points in the square would have to move through positions previously occupied by the northern points, but that's not my meaning. I mean that every point in you, for you are a square, and will serve for the purpose of my illustration, every point in you, that is to say in what you call your inside, is to pass upwards through space in such a way that no point shall pass through the position previously occupied by any other point. But each point shall describe a straight line of its own. This is all in accordance with analogy. Surely it must be clear to you. Restraining my impatience, for I was now under a strong temptation to rush blindly at my visitor and to precipitate him into space and out of flatland anywhere so that I could get rid of him, I replied, and what may be the nature of the figure which I am to shape out by this motion which you are pleased to denote by the word upward? I presume it is describable in the language of Flatland. Oh, certainly. It's all plain and simple, and in strict accordance with analogy, only, by the way, you must or not speak of the results as being a figure, but as a solid. Uh, but I will describe it to you, or rather... Not I, but analogy. We begin with a single point, which, of course, it's being itself a point, only has one terminal point. One point producing a line with two terminal points. One line producing a square with four terminal points. Now you can give yourself the answer to your own question. One, two, four are evidently in geometrical progression. What's the next number? Eight. Exactly. The one square produces a s something which you do not as yet know a name for, but which we call a cube with eight terminal points. Now, are you convinced? And has this creature sides as well as angles, or what you call terminal points? Well, of course, and all according to analogy. Uh, but, but by the way... Not what, you, not what you call sides, but what we call sides. Uh, you would call them solids. And how many solids or sides will I pertain to this being who I am to generate by the motion of my inside in an upward direction and whom you would call a cube? How can you ask? And you, a mathematician, the side of anything is always, if I may so say, one dimension behind the thing. 
Uh, consequently, as there is no dimension behind a point, a point has zero sides. A line, if I may so say, has two sides, for the points of a line may be called by courtesy its sides. Uh, a square has four sides, zero, two, four. What progression would you call that? A arithmetical. And what's the next number? Six. Exactly. Well, then you see, you have answered your own question. The cube which you will generate will be bounded by six sides. That is to say, six of your insides. Hey, you see it all now, yeah? Monster! I shrieked. Be thou juggler, enchanter, dream, or devil, no more will I endure thy mockeries. Either thou or I must perish. And saying these words, I precipitated myself upon him. Thank you for listening to Stories from the Hibernation. Comment on the website at grizzliesgrowls.com. This program is offered under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.